One of the funny coincidences about my and Dion Garrett's lives is that separately at different times in different states, while each of us were working our way through higher education, we both spent some time working as a server at Outback Steakhouse. Which, if you know that restaurant, they have a slogan uh, that they've had for a very long time, no rules, just right. Uh, which I got very used to saying in a very fake Australian accent for several years. Nye rules, just right. Um, no one actually thought I was Australian. But what makes a really good uh, restaurant slogan doesn't play out quite so well when it's also the credo by which a society lives, right? If we live in a place where, where there's no rules, where everyone just gets to do what they want to do, uh, there's issues there. And yet, I, th I think we'd all look around and we'd recognize that that's how most of the people around us live their lives. Uh, Billy Joel had this great song called My Life. Uh, and and the, one, the one line is, it, uh, you know, is, go ahead with your own life, leave me alone. And I think that that song summarizes so well how I think most of our own culture looks at Christians. They look at us and they say, hey, you want to waste a beautiful spring Sunday morning sitting in a church singing songs together? Great. Fine. You want to read an ancient, archaic book uh, that's 2,000 years old and act like that has any relevance to your life? Great. But you want to tell me what to do? You want to inflict your morality on me? You can just go away. This is the place we live, is that there are no rules, just right. Whatever you want to do is what you should be allowed to do. Uh, in fact, I'd say most people, if you, if you said that to them or brought that up to them, they'd agree with you. They'd say, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and they'd, it'd be a badge of pride that no one gets to tell me what to do. This isn't new. In fact, you can go all the way to the Old Testament, and if you look in the book of Judges, it describes the culture at that time. It says it this way, in those days, Israel had no king, Everyone did as they saw fit. Uh, just to give a little flavor to this, you know, that's not the only way you can translate this last half of the sentence. That's how NIV did it. But you can also say, in those days, you know, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Whatever you thought was right, that's great. Or maybe this way, each person did whatever seemed right in his own opinion. Everyone has an opinion, and your opinion is just as valid as mine. We don't even need to argue anymore uh, because we all have opinions, and everyone's opinion is right. Or I think the message is the most blunt, and it's the one I probably like the best. People did whatever they felt like doing. And doesn't that feel accurate? Doesn't that feel like when you look around, that's kind of what we've got going on today. People do whatever they feel like doing, and nobody can say boo. They can, they can scoff at laws, they can, they can do things that hurt other people, they can make uh, immoral choices. People do whatever they feel like doing, and this is just where we live. The thing to note, though, is that I don't think this is actually the kind of problem that we sometimes frame it as. I don't think this is a problem out there. I don't think this is a problem with the secularists, with the liberals, with the atheists. I think this is as much a problem in here as it is out there. Partly because if you go and look at this, they're not talking about the unbelievers in this passage. They're talking about the God-fearing church folk. They're saying even the believers 
acted this way. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we recognize that we are maybe living in a glass house and shouldn't be throwing stones because we ourselves don't really like it when people tell us what to do. I see it in some of my own good friends who are, who are Christians, uh, and yet they've been church hopping for the last 10 years because they'll go somewhere and then the pastor will inevitably say something that they disagree with and then they will go somewhere else and the cycle starts over again. Or I'll be real transparent with you. I see it in my own life. I, I think, I act, I stand up here and I say that there's this Bible and God has word, word for us and we need to obey it and listen to it and, uh, and we should. Uh, but if I'm real honest, I don't always do that myself. I find it's much easier to obey God's word when it already conforms to what I've already decided. Uh, one example, I think, God, I think the Bible is very clear that we don't take revenge or retribution, that Christians uh, shouldn't sue uh, other people. Christians shouldn't fight back when they are wronged, even if someone breaks the law against them. The, the Bible says over and over again, but one example, if someone even steals your shirt, they break the law, they steal your shirt, what should a Christian do? Give them the cloak off your back as well. I think the Bible is completely unambiguous on this point of how we are supposed to respond morally when we are wronged. And then a few years ago, someone broke into my house, stole $500, stole my car, and wrecked it. And I think maybe Jesus was being metaphorical when he said, turn the other cheek. Surely he didn't mean that. Right, at the end of the day, I, I'm just honest, I don't wanna be controlled by God's rules either. As long as they seem like they're gonna work out well for me or they, uh, or they seem obvious and they're gonna make sense and we have security, fine. I'll obey God's rules as long as it's convenient uh, and appropriate to me. The moment it's not, I myself start looking for some hedge. I try to find some wiggle room. This is a problem for all of us. And so we have to grapple ourselves with if we don't even want God controlling our lives, if we wanna to cling to control and dictate the rules for ourselves, which Bible rules we follow, which ones we don't, then we gotta be honest about that. And we've also gotta be honest about the fact that it, it then puts us in a bad spot when we wanna then control other people's behavior, when we wanna point a finger and we wanna lecture the people in the world around us for their immorality and all the ways they break God's laws. So that brings us to this week's message. We're in Revelation chapter two, no rules, just right. And, and as we dive into Revelation today, just to share with you, uh, I loved what Dion Garrett did as he introduced Revelation last week on Easter, but um, we were in, I was in our spiritual growth experience, which we do every Tuesday night down in the commons downstairs. And if you're interested in taking a next step in your own faith journey, you should join us. But we were there talking about uh, Dion's message and everyone in my group was sharing how they didn't wanna touch Revelation with a 20 foot pole. I had one guy say, you know, I read Revelation one time in the 70s and I've just never felt the need to look at it again since. People are scared, they're intimidated by Revelation and for good reason, it's been a book that's, that's controversial, it's confusing. Here's the thing that's helped me to grapple with Revelation and so I'm gonna share this with you today because it's gonna be how we look at it this morning is I think Revelation makes the most sense if we understand that Revelation is the comic book portion of the Bible. It is. And comic books, I don't mean that pejoratively, comic books are incredibly important for us as human beings as we grapple with life and truth and reality. Now maybe you don't understand that that sounds a little weird. I think people are used to thinking of comic books as like escapism and fantasy, but actually I think comic books are so healthy and necessary for us as we grow. And I think there's, we recognize that, which is why Endgame has come out this weekend and has already broken every box office record that there is. Because people, they, they, they want to see something, they, they're finding something in these comic book movies that we're not getting anywhere else. For me, growing up, it was Spider-Man. I was, as you can probably guess, I was the nerdy kid that got bullied and picked on a lot in school. And, and as I was struggling to make sense of that and, and trying to figure out what this meant, my best refuge was the Spider-Man comics. Because here was this kid, Peter Parker, who was nerdy and smart and all these things and was bullied and picked on, and then suddenly he got mutant spider powers. 
And suddenly he had choices, he had options available to him and he you know, got to figure out, you know, what do I do with this now that I have strength, now that I can beat up the bully who was beating me up. And, and, and he had to learn very dearly what, what one of his mentors said to him, which is that with great power comes great responsibility. And that lodged in my soul when I read that. Not because I was ever likely to get mutant spider powers, but because if this is true for someone who's living life in a larger than life way, this is what comic books bring us. They, they bring us su, um, superlatives and they bring us vibrant colors and, and unique, uh, huge, extravagant situations where he's fighting off buses and, and, and supervillains. I just had the local bully in my seventh grade class. But if he himself had to figure out what it meant to have great power and that great responsibility that came with it, then maybe that helped me understand what I needed to do and how I needed to act as the kid who felt bullied and picked on and left out. You see, what comic books do is they take ordinary life, but they look at it through this filter that is so much larger and more vibrant and more interesting. They help us to see our own lives in a different way. And just as importantly, because they're so big and splashy, they also help us feel emotions in a way that we don't always have the freedom and permission to do in real life. But when you're watching that hero face off against the supervillain and, and you're feeling everything that goes along with that, it actually helps you frame a little better those little petty battles that you're fighting each and every day in your own life. That's the good that comic books do for us. That's why those movies are so popular these days. And if we look at Revelation, through that same filter, a lot of things that maybe were confusing before actually make way more sense. Revelation is the comic book, the larger than life superhero version of events that helps us frame and understand and feel our own lives better. Now maybe that feels like a stretch to you. I think I'm gonna be able to persuade you this morning as we look through Revelation, how the comic book understanding makes it make way more sense. So let's look. This is a letter to the church in Thyatira, and this is what uh, Jesus says to them. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? These are the words of the Son of God, Jesus himself, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. And already, people are tripped up. This is not the description of Jesus that we are used to. And if you're just reading Revelation straight and you're trying to understand it and you get to this moment, you just say, already you've lost me, Revelation. What does it mean? He's got eyes like blazing fire and feet like burnished bronze. That, that doesn't make sense. But if you put the comic book filter on, suddenly it does make sense. In fact, you all are very used to this kind of visual imagery. You just don't realize it. To give you one example, Captain Marvel is one of these comic book movies that's been big the last few months. And there's this moment in Captain Marvel where Carol Danvers, who's that, that human that we've come to know and love, and she's gotten knocked down and picked herself up, and she's just been a normal person. Suddenly, she comes into power and authority. And look how that moment is revealed in that movie. I'm not what you think I am. Yeah, she's about to kick some butt, right? Right, none of us are confused about that moment, are we? In this moment, you see this person who you think you know, and suddenly her eyes are like blazing fire, and you know that she's about to lay down some wrath on the bad guys. See, it's a visual metaphor that, that makes complete sense to us. We just don't think to apply it when we read the Bible. We just get to this part and it says, his eyes are like blazing fire. That's so confusing. That's so weird. No, it isn't. It's this moment. John is describing superhero Jesus. This is the original comic book, folks. And he's saying, no, no, you're used to this guy. You, you, some of these people, you literally watched him get hung on a cross and die. You're used to someone who was meek and mild and spoke words of truth. He's like, but I need you to understand there's another side of Jesus. And that when he comes back, when he speaks to the church, it's with eyes like blazing fire. He means business. Feet like armored feet in bronze. He's standing here planted. And no one is gonna say boo to this guy now. See, the comic book imagery helps us understand a little better what John is trying to describe to us, all right? So Jesus is coming, not in meekness and mildness, in full power and authority. His eyes are like blazing fire, and he's got something to say to you. And now you get the tone 
What is he gonna say to us? Here's what he says. He says, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Like he's saying, no, you guys, you're doing a good job. I appreciate what you're doing. However, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. And by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality. And just pause here, go back there for a second. That he's calling out, that if you don't know this imagery, this is something that would have been very familiar to the people at the time. Jezebel was a woman that was notorious in their history uh, who had compromised the faith and in fact tried to put to death people that honored their faith in God. And Jesus is calling out one example of this, and I wanna just spend a moment here, but not to get too hung up on it. He's going, one of the examples is the sexual immorality. He's saying, we, we, you gotta deal with this. Like, this is not good in your community of faith. And if we read this and, and we, we focus on this, again, in this external way, oh yeah, he's so right, look at our culture. This is such a sexually immoral culture. Then we miss the point that he's talking to his people in this moment. And it's not enough for us to point our fingers and say, oh yeah, that culture, they're out there with their, you know, with their homosexuality and their sexual ethics and their transgender and their abortion and, and to be pointing out there that there's something wrong with them and we try to enforce God's rules on them. But we miss the fact that we are struggling with the exact same thing. That Christian divorce is just as rampant as secular divorce. That we are dealing with premarital sex in the same way that the culture is. That we ourselves tend to think, you know, when Jesus said don't look at a woman lustfully, he didn't know about computer screens. <laughs> that kind of changes the situation, right? See, if it becomes an excuse for us to lecture and blame and judge and try to control others' morality, we, we've missed the point. And ultimately, again, this is just actually one example. See, the problem with Jezebel was not her sexual immorality. The problem was that she watered down the faith so much and actually created barriers for people to actually know and love the true God. And so the issue that Jesus is calling out here is that when we let other things dilute our own message, when we let Christianity be about Jesus and these other rules that we're gonna impose upon you, we're actually keeping people away from Jesus himself. And so this is what he's coming back to say. He's saying, we gotta get people back to the true thing here, which is this relationship with God. So what does that look like? He keeps going. He says, you know, there's, there's this eating of food sacrifice to idols. I have given her, this Jezebel, the person who's um, polluting the true worship of God, I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead, the, the people who follow her, uh, and then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. Those flaming, blazing eyes, that's x-ray vision that sees into the hearts and minds of everyone he looks at. And I will repay each of you according to your deeds. He says, I'm gonna come back in power with x-ray vision and I'm gonna tell you what you actually are doing for real. Not what your outside actions look like because again, it's real easy to follow God's rules when they just are comfortable for us anyway but your hearts and your minds, where are you? And what are you trying to do? And so this is the conundrum that's facing the church in Thyatira. It's the conundrum that's facing us now. How do we be true to God's law, to God's word, to this relationship that he's called us to have? How are we faithful the way Jesus asks us to be faithful in a world that resists any of our correction or our control? This is what we're gonna spend the next 15 minutes or so trying to wrestle with as a group, and it's what I think Revelation helps us to do because we're gonna use some comic book imagery to, to paint this conundrum in very big, larger than life ways so that we can understand it a little better. So for this, we're gonna to go to Revelation chapter eight. And in Revelation eight, God is painting this picture that we've already described. There's a world where there's no rules, just right. People have rejected God's laws. Uh, no one wants to listen to what they should be doing. People just wanna do whatever they feel like doing and there's no right or wrong anymore. And in this world, God's judgment 
comes against them in powerful ways on Earth. And so just to give you some, some nutshell uh, examples, so these are the earthly examples uh, in Revelation chapter eight and nine, some of the ways that God's power and judgment comes against people who are disobeying his law. So there came hail and fire mixed with blood and a third of the earth was burned up, okay? Then a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea turned into blood. Okay, very weird, creepy stuff, all right? But you might notice that these are starting to be familiar images. We're gonna keep going. A great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers, and a third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from drinking them. Keep going. A third of the sun was struck, and a third of the day was without light. There's darkness over the land. And then locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. Like, so notice these things, that there's water turning to blood, there's darkness over the land, there's locusts. And if you were one of the people at the church of Thyatira, this would all start to sound very familiar to you. Does this sound familiar to any of you? See, it's starting to evoke imagery of the plagues of Egypt that God did once upon a time back in Israel's history. You see, back in a place where people were, were ignoring God and doing whatever they wanted, God came against them in power and judgment and he turned water into blood. He, he brought darkness to the land. He brought a plague of locusts. And so these people to recognize that, that John was not necessarily predicting something in the future, but he was calling them to something in the past and saying, remember what God does. He comes in judgment when people disobey him. And, and then there's these locusts. And I wanna focus on these locusts for a second because this may be stuck out oddly to you. So let's read a little more about these locusts in chapter eight. Here's the fuller description. Out of the smoke, God opens up an abyss, and out of the smoke of the abyss, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. And then during these days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The locusts look like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails with stingers like scorpions, and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon, that is, the destroyer. Why did I read this part of Revelation to you? Because it's awesome. Is this not the most crazy, bizarre image you've ever seen in your life? Giant horse locusts with teeth like lions and tails like scorpions. This is in there because it's just this amazing picture of something mighty and awesome that you would never in a million years picture. It's in this part of Revelation for the same reason that in one of these Marvel comic book movies they had Thor, the God of Thunder, fight against the Incredible Hulk. There was no reason for it other than that it was awesome. You wanted to see these two mighty beasts just fight each other and wail on each other for five minutes. That's what people wanted to see. See, the point is, it's making this extreme, larger than life thing. Like, you know, when he's trying to paint this picture of God's judgment, he's painting it in a way that is beyond anything you could ever imagine. He's describing the worst thing that he could think to describe to, to make clear that God's judgment is truly powerful and terrible. But then here's the point. After all of this, after all these plagues and darkness and freaky giant scorpion locusts, here's the end result for the people that see this judgment. Chapter nine. It says the rest of the mankind who weren't killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They didn't stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. See, picture the worst consequences you can imagine. 
picture a God doing everything that people deserve and showing them the error of their ways in the most grotesque way imaginable, they still don't repent. It doesn't actually do anything to save anybody. And if God's divine, grotesque judgment isn't gonna accomplish that, what do you think your and my lectures are gonna do? What do you think is the difference if we really put some consequences on other people's immoral behavior and we start just trying to make a lot of rules that they need to follow because then they'll see the error of their ways? No, they won't. They won't see the error of their ways when God himself shows up in power. They're sure not gonna see the error of their ways when a Christian just judges them and points a finger and lectures them. Trying to control other people is not the answer. And the way to be faithful to God's teaching, the way to be faithful to Jesus, the way he calls the church in Thyatira and the way he calls us to be is not ultimately to condemn and lecture and create more rules for others to follow. So what is it? Well, this is where the comic book story keeps going and it gives us some different pictures. See, if you continue on into chapter 10, it describes this moment. All right, so then John, who's writing this whole thing, says he saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, shining so bright you couldn't even look at it, and his legs were like fiery pillars. And he was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land, and he gave out a loud shout like the roar of a lion. Picture something giant and awesome coming down from earth and that's so big that everyone can see the power and might in this person. All right, again, the comic book imagery continues. But notice that this angel has a little scroll in his hand. So what's that about? So I went to the angel and I asked him to give me that little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. So I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and I ate it. And sure enough, it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. So again, we have this comic book moment where, where John is describing something that we already know, but he's describing it in different terms. Kind of like in these Marvel movies where they've got these infinity stones that each represent some power or, uh, or force in the world, but they're, but they're representing it as a stone and it helps you engage with it a little different. There's something important here and it's being described as a little scroll that John needs to eat. So what is it? Well, I'll spare you all the, the speculation and the study. I, I've done it for you. That little scroll is, in a nutshell, the good news of God through Christ Jesus. It's the gospel message. And so when he says it's as sweet as honey, he's describing this literal truth, this news that we get to proclaim to the world that there is a God who doesn't actually want to lord it over people, doesn't actually want to strike them down with hail and blood and giant scorpions, but a God who says, I'm actually willing to take all the judgment on myself, to sacrifice myself, to be hung up and die on a cross because I love you and I want all of you to turn from the ways that lead to death and destruction. I want you to turn to me and find life and love and hope. This is the sweetness of the little scroll. And you ask why, why it is also sour. Well, it's because as anyone knows who's tried to follow Christ is that you get to those moments where someone wrecks your car and it feels pretty sour to have to say, I guess I'm not going to press charges. See, this, this good news that it's so sweet, it also sets us up for a life that is sometimes gonna have sour moments. Or we're gonna feel that persecution and judgment and scorn from the people around us and it's gonna be bitter. But even the bitterness we can take because the sweetness of this good news is so powerful. See, and, and the picture here is not that you take this little scroll and that you cream somebody over the head with it. Right, it's not, the Bible isn't some bat that we beat someone up and say, hey, you need to understand this. The scroll is something that we eat. We internalize, we let it refresh and energize and ultimately transform us. See, and instead then of it being this thing where God has all of these rules that he's trying to control us, even his children and his followers, it's no longer this external control that God has. It's now God saying, no, I actually, I wanna change you from the inside out in a good way. 
I want you to feel energy and refreshment like you've never had it before. I want you to eat food that gives life in a way that regular earthly food doesn't. This is the little scroll. And the way we use it is by letting it, by internalizing it and letting it change us from the inside out. And if we do that, then we become witnesses to the world. See, the story continues on. It says, God says, I will appoint my two witnesses. And um, people talk about who these witnesses are. The witnesses, they're us. They're the collective witness of the church. This is what we, as the community of faith, we are these witnesses. And they will prophesy for a thousand days, clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees, the two lampstands. Again, these are symbols of God's people. Uh, and they will stand before the Lord of the earth. They will have access to God in a way that other people don't have access to God. And if anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm my people must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so they will not rain during the time they are prophesying. They will have power to turn the waters into blood themselves and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. But now, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city and the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. Didn't see that twist coming. But here's the picture. The picture is that if we've internalized God's word, let it transform us, then we actually become witnesses to the world. And witnesses who, in spite of the power that they wield, in spite of flames that can come from their mouths, again, this is comic book imagery, this thing, like you would have this level of supernatural power, flames and the ability to shut up the sky and bring plagues whenever you want, but that doesn't actually change anyone and you don't use it to control anyone. Instead, you get killed for it. It doesn't necessarily sound like something any of us would want or choose. And yet notice how often this kind of reality plays into the stories that we watch. If any of you have been following these comic book movies, the last one ended with half of the superheroes getting killed. And you watch Spider-Man dissolve into dust. And you go, what's the point of having all these powers if you just end up dying? Well, the good news is, Spider-Man's got another movie coming out later this summer, so you know he's coming back somehow. And in the same way, the story doesn't end here. You know that this isn't the end for these witnesses either. Here's how the story keeps going. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God enters into these witnesses, enters into his people, and they stand back on their feet, and terror strikes those who see them. And then they will hear a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here and the witnesses will go up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies look on in awe and terror. See, resurrection is waiting for us. But it doesn't come because we wield our power against those around us. It comes because we submit to the persecution and the hate and the judgment of others around us. And if we do it faithfully and if we can do it because we've let God's little scroll change us from the inside out, and we get resurrected and all of their gloating and glee turns into terror when they see this truth. See, the way we make a difference in this world, the way that we are faithful to God's truth and actually have a hope of changing and transforming the people around us is by letting God's word transform us and then applying it, not in force, not in control, but we're going back to what he said to Thyatira in the beginning. Next slide. This is what he said to them when he was complimenting them, when he was praising them. He said, These, this is the good thing you're doing. Your love, your faith, your service, and your perseverance. See, this is the picture. This is how we're faithful without trying to control others, is that we persevere in the face of suffering. We love and serve them with no agenda. We let them see a transformed, faithful people and then that's what's gonna make the difference. Not any control or power that we wield. See, Jesus finishes out this letter this way. This is the end of the letter. 
He says, now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, he said, this is the faithful people. I'm saying to you who are faithful, this is what you need to know. To you who do not hold to Jezebel's teaching, you have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, you who have been faithful, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. I just want you to sit here for a moment. Jesus himself, with the blazing eyes, the feet of bronze, the guy who's coming to make everything right in power and all of his superhero glory, isn't looking to put more rules on us. He isn't looking to try to control us in other ways. He's painted that picture. He knows full well that all of the asteroids and all of the scorpions and all of the plagues in the world don't change anything. And he's not looking to burden us with one more correction, one more lecture, one more judgment. He's saying, all I'm asking you to do is to cling to the thing that you have. And that thing that we have is Jesus himself. The thing we have is this person in all of his power and might and glory who says, I just wanna be with you. Be faithful to me, not to the rules, not to, the, not to the, all the things we build up around faith. Just cling to that thing you have, which is me, because he is clinging onto you first. See, I think what we react to is when we see all of the things go wrong around us, when we see a society that rejects rules, is that we think what we have to do is do more rules. Or the other side is that we think maybe, maybe we just need more grace, more freedom, just let anyone do what they want. But the answer is we don't need more rules and we don't need more grace. We need more Jesus. We need more relationship with the one who has all the power and yet also has all the love. And that served us first so that we can serve others. And the amazing promise is that Jesus says, if we do that, if we cling to him, not, not to the rules, not to even further moralistic agendas, if we cling to him, here's the ultimate promise to that one, to those of us who are victorious and do his will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, just as I have received authority from my father. See, here's the irony. We cling to control on earth. We wanna control our lives. We wanna dictate other people's actions. And yet what Jesus is saying, if you actually just cling to me, you will have all authority over all the nations, not just uh, in your puny few decades of life on earth, but for all time in heaven, throned on high with me, we will rule together. This is what our victorious Jesus promises us, is relationship with him in this life, true authority in the next, and it doesn't take one more rule or one more ounce of control. It just takes trusting him, letting him live in our hearts and knowing that he's gonna see it through to the end on our behalf. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we give you thanks that uh, you paint in such clear, extravagant pictures how much your love for us is so much more important than your judgment for us. And Lord, as we grapple with this imagery, as we, as we try to figure out what this means for us as we go about living our lives, being faithful to your word, but also not trying to, to control or alienate or, or do disservice to those who need to know your love, Lord, I pray that your little scroll would truly nourish each and every one of us, that it would fill our mouths with the sweetness of honey that would sustain us through the bitterness and the sourness that comes from struggles and persecution. And Lord, I pray that you would use us in mighty ways, that our love and service would transform people in a way that no ounce of control could, and that you would use all of this to help us make an impact both in this life and all the way until we reign with you on high in heaven forever. We pray this in your holy name, amen. The son of God with the eyes that blaze like fire and feet like bronze has achieved victory on our behalf. And so let us now sing together this forever victory that we now have because of Christ himself. <laughs>